世界各地的嘉宾，大家好，欢迎各位。Hello, everyone from over the world. Welcome to the InfoLink online seminar. Before today's seminar officially starts, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions about today's content, you can leave your question in the chat room, and we will reply directly in the Q A session. If there is too late to reply, we will have someone who will answer by email after the meeting. We provided a questionnaire survey and the notice letter before the meeting. Please fill in the questionnaire after participating in today's seminar to help us improve next time. In addition, the original audio message today is in Mandarin, so if you need to listen to English, please click on the integration function at the bottom of the screen. The annual Shanghai SNEC exhibition always highlights the future outlook for the PV industry. Infolink actually visited the exhibition this year to observe the product, products and trends exhibited by manufacturers this year. During the exhibition, you can see manufacturers launching products with higher efficiency and higher power output. Large format modules equipment also continue to improve. In today's first session, we will discuss solar cells and module technology trends. The polysilicon shortage and price increase that started last year continue until this year and finally began to stagnate in June. In the second session, we will analyze the PV supply chain to analyze how the high price of silicon materials will affect the PV and market demand and price trends in the second half of the year. The last session will be one of the highlights of this year's exhibition: energy storage. We will analyze the prospects of the energy storage markets from policy, price, market. Business model and supply chain levels, and use case analysis and calculations to understand the economy value that energy storage can bring. Next, let us let our chief analyst Karine start to talk about our current development trend of PV products from the observation of this year's exhibition. Hello, everyone. I'm Karine. Today, I will share with you what we have seen this year in terms of PV cell and module technology trends. Today, I will divide my presentation into four parts. I will start with the product overview that we see in Shanghai this year. Then, I will talk about cell technology and module. Last, I will. Uh, have a conclusion on the technology. Let's start with the product review. Firstly, for the top five manufacturers, let me show you what they have shown at the exhibition. This year, what's different is that the N-type products mostly are large format. This year, during the past year, we see that there's a significant progress in terms of the size. This year, it focused more on 182 and 210, whether for Topcon or、uh, other types of products. On the right-hand side, you can see the products of these large manufacturers. For N-type, for large format, in the past, we have seen issues for、uh, cutting damage. In the past, this year, manufacturers also began to discuss whether the process flow should be、uh, improved. And when it comes to the cost, in terms of the thickness of the wafer, this year for P-type from 175 to 170, for large format, part of it's still 175, but some of it has moved to 170. For N-type, we see more bifacial、uh, modules. So for large format N-type products, the market share of bif bifacial modules continue to increase. Because more will be、um, installed to grounded power stations, 
And in terms of the um, auxiliary materials, we haven't seen many special changes this year. For most discussion were focused on the size and the uh, technology. So we will not talk too much about that today. Okay, so the products from the five major manufacturers from 166, 182 to one, uh, 210, whether for P-type or N-type, we think that in the next one or two years, 166 will continue to exist in the market. It will not disappear from the market too soon. It will not replace by 182 or 210 immediately because rooftop markets, whether for uh, households or uh, industries, we will continue to see the application of 166. 182 and 210 uh, has become when it become more mature for rooftop markets, it will then replace 166. So from the chart that you can see that traditional 166 are still mainly uh, launched at 500 watts. For 182, you can also see that in addition to uh, Jinko, J-Star and Longji, on the right-hand side, Canadian Solar also have similar products and plus the triangle 210. You can see that Trina also launched N-type, a large format, more than 700 watts. What's different from 182 is that for 210, we can see the products of, one, of a larger format or uh, 1300. So during the past few years, we see the development of mainstream module power output. For 2019, we start from M2, migrated to larger format. So that year, we see a lot of 400 watt products based on G1. In 2020, we see M6 um, spread it faster. So the power output has migrated from 400 to 440. This year, for the first half of the year, although we still see a lot of O project using G1 uh, and M6. But for the second half of the year, we will see more M10 and G12 for large grounded power station. So for the mainstream this year, from 440 watts for H1, for the second half of the year, you will be more than 500 watts. For rooftop products, M6 will still be the mainstream. So for next year, from the exhibition, we will see that for G12, this year, mostly will be based on 50 or 50 pieces or 550 watts. In the future, it will move up to 60 pieces and 600 watts. For M10, uh, we'll also see the similar trend. So for this year, 535 to 550 watts. Next year, the power output will further increase next year. And now we finally see that the wafer size stay at 182 and 210. And uh, we will see further progress in this area. Here, as you can see, for the wafer output of the top five manufacturers, Based on the statistics, the size in Q1 and Q2, we have already seen some changes. So we can compare the bar chart on the left and right hand side. For vertical integrators, whether for Longji or JA Solar or Jinko, the larger size will continue to increase. Uh, wafer makers, whether for Zhonghuan or Shangji and others, as you can see for Q1 and Q2, we see that larger formats are increasing. So based on the uh, rough output, we can uh, make a rough forecast. So this is the trends for larger format from 2020 to 2025. We distinguish by color for yellow, it is 166, orange 182, blue uh, 210 for this year, for the first half of the year, we think that 182 and 210, the market share will be similar. 
judging from this chart, why we still think that 182, the market share will be slightly larger than 210, because for the second half of the year, a lot of manufacturers, if they only step in the production of larger format this year, they will start with 182, and the size will be increased for uh, H2. So 182, the output growth will be faster. 182 plus 210, the total market share will increase to around 50%. For M6, 30% this year, next year, will focus only on the rooftop market. So M6, the market share will decrease to around 20% of market share. For conventional sizes, M2 and G1, judging from the current situation, the market share has been decreasing. So you will uh, gradually face off from the market in the next few years. From 2023, 182 and 210 will continue to progress on the market and which size will grow faster. That really depends on the price of the uh, wafer or the final price of the uh, products. So it's really difficult to say at this moment if we're talking about the long term. The mainstream will be 182 in the next two years. And when the market become more mature, we'll be able to see more 210. So that's for the size. Next, let, let me talk about the cell technology. Like with the, in the past, we show the product technology. Orange represents perk, yellow, is the end type a lot of people are curious about the uh, market share for q for n type um, in the future and the gray area as we can see thin film the market share is quite fixed during the past few years for annual growth as we can see thin film started to increase slightly because during the trade war, thin film products uh, will not affect it that much. So first solar in the US, the uh, production continued to increase. And from some public information, we can also see that thin film products in terms of wattage or cost, we see some major breakthrough. So that's something we can pay more attention to. For PERC, in the past few years, it, the uh, Cost price value is uh, staying at a very good level. So we still think that it will be a mainstream product this year. So for N type, we need to observe the future uh, speed of growth. On the left hand side, this is the forecast of module shipment. So starting from last year, this year to next year, N type, the market share is quite similar. When the uh, value emerged, the market share will increase accordingly. On the right-hand side, this is the forecast for the actual shipment. And type from last year to this year, the shipment actually decreased a little bit. It's because P type has been introducing larger format, which squeeze the market share of N type. But as you can see, many large manufacturers will continue to do SJT. So in the next few years, N-type products, if it can really cost down and the um, value will increase, the market share will increase after 2023. This page, we see the N-type shipment worldwide. Uh, for the bar chart at the bottom, we divided them into China and non-China manufacturers. For 2020, for 2020 or years before 2020, every year, non-China untype um, output is larger than China manufacturers because there are some large manufacturers uh, that has a lot of uh, very stable incomes. So SJT, Topcom, and IBC has been quite stable. Last year, we see Topcom has become the mainstream last year. But this year, we see the change. This year, for the N-type production, 
uh, it actually exceeded that of non-China manufacturers. And because of the withdrawal of Panasonic, so SJT becomes smaller in terms of the market share. For China, Topcon is the mainstream. SJT because it's still in the process of cost down. So based on our observation, SJT's market share hasn't uh, reached as high as we expected. So in terms of the distribution of overseas markets, the tar target will be Japan, Europe, or US, mostly focused on rooftop markets. For China manufacturers, some of them are shipped to ground power stations. So it's mostly focused on Southeast Asia or emerging market. So here you can see the uh, current capacity status. On the left hand side, you see the current uh, capacity. On the right hand side, those are the planned expansion. On the left hand side, the actual uh, manufacturers uh, producing Topcom is not that much, but we are already seeing some companies doing so. And in the future, we focus a lot on several major manufacturers, especially the uh, equipment moving, Longqi. It has uh, three gigawatts in plan. So people have been paying attention to the progress and schedule of mass production. For Topcon this year, what's different from the past is that in the past, it's more on LPCVD. But this year, as you may feel, there are more and more new Topcon manufacturers are considering PCVD. So we haven't seen a final trend of the technology. We need to observe what will emerge in the next uh, one year or so. For SJT capacity, it's uh, quite different from Topcom. For SJT, there are more manufacturers, but the actual capacity for each manufacturer has been uh, smaller compared with uh, Topcon because in terms of the uh, investment, it's actually higher than Topcon. We have had seen a lot of investments um, during the past few years. This year, uh, from last year's, this year, uh, the cost has reduced the uh, to renminbi 450 million for one gigawatts. So the industry plays close attention to whether uh, these scale capacity expansion can bring SJT costs down next year. So against this backdrop, large manufacturers in China and abroad mostly install lines for R&D pilot running this year. We need to observe the further trends in the next one or two years. And among these manufacturers, we pay more attention to Tongwei. They have uh, about one gigawatts of new light in mid-2021. If we see more companies like this, we plan to see further cost out of HAT. So for N-type technology, the challenge is the cost. Compared with P-type, we see a more significant gap. So here we also show PERC, the gray line and Topcon, the yellow line, and compare that with the orange line of SJT. You can see very clearly that in 2021, SJT's cost is still higher than Topcon and PERC. So there are some differences in terms of equipment, but in terms of the capacity, SJT's individual capacity is not as high as the others. And another disadvantage is that for the um, raw material usage, SJT is still the highest. So the cost down pace is not that fast. For Topcon, during the past one or two years, the equipment investment cost has gone down significantly. For one gigawatt of PERC upgraded to Topcon, the cost has been much lower than the past. So for Topcon, if you continue to cost down, you also need to 
uh, rely on the uh, metal materials to further uh, short, shorten the gap between that and perk. So from this year to next year, N type uh, will gradually step into the mature stage. From here, you can see that the cost gap is not that easy to uh, close. But in one or two years, whether for SJT or Topcon, we will see more cost down. And for PERC, after introducing 182 and 210, the uh, cost reduction will be slower. So whether from the capacity or from the manufacturing cost, we think that after 2022, the gap, the cost, of, the gap of cost will be become smaller um, in the future, and that really depends on the uh, production results and the speed of reduction, reducing costs. Whether these activities can reach the expected results or goals. Okay, we also use this charts a lot, comparing the cost and profitability of cell technologies. Firstly, in terms of the power output for different products, if, you, if they're of the same size, N-Type, of course, has the advantage in terms of power output. But after the introduction of larger format, PERC introduced large format, but the products uh, will not introduce the uh, large format that fast. So for per products, the power output is over 500 watts. So you can see the difference here. For CTM, uh, while introducing uh, uh, larger format, we also see the uh, CTM. So P-type products, 0%, N-type, we still see some uh, CTM loss. For wafer price, as you can see here, you can see the arrow in the middle, M10 and G12. The wafer price uh, will go down to per the cost per watts. So based on the quotation this year, the price per watt is has been increasing for the first half of the year. So whether these two prices will become consistent, will still have a difference. That really depends on the strategy planning for the two camps. In terms of uh, thinning during the past few years, we've been talking about the HJT technology. And from the uh, wafer type, yes, HJT, the thickness is uh, thinner. But the difference is not that much. It's, on, it's only the difference between 170 to 160. Uh, so we are s trying to see whether we will see more uh, thickness reduction for SJT in the next few years. In terms of the module cost, larger format still uh, leads the cost down of the module cost. So PERC has to take the has had the advantage. So we will see Topcon and HAT after they introduce larger format, larger sizes, we will see uh, the module cost going down as well. So from these several products, we can see that based on the current profitability, while N-type, the profitability looks good, but because of the cost per watts, there is a gap between it and the P-type, so whether for Topcon or SJT, the sales momentum hasn't been that good this year. That really depends on whether they are able to reduce the cost further. Lastly, let's compare the uh, forecast and capacity estimation. Gray bar represents Topcon, yellow SJT. And there is some very small uh, orange bar that represents IBC. So from 2021 to 2022, in terms of the capacity, we will see a significant increase. Well, SJT and Topcon are both growing, but Topcon 
actually will、uh, expand faster in terms of capacity because Perk expansion has already reserved the space for Topcom. It can、uh, upgrade directly, but for SJT, it cannot be compatible with Perk capacity. So the Growth of、uh, HIT will be smaller than Topcon in terms of the capacity from this year to next year. The two N-type products growth will not be that significant because for N-type to introduce larger format, it still takes some time. And in terms of cost reduction, it will also require a longer period. So for 2022, we will focus more. On、uh, cost reduction and the maturity of equipment. Once we achieve these two targets, after 2023, we will see a more significant growth in terms of the capacity, and the topcom growth will be slightly faster because there are still too there are too many, too much perk capacity at this moment, and it's not difficult for them to upgrade to topcom. So that's for cell technology. In terms of module technology, in the beginning we also show the top five integrators, vertical integrators, about their products. Again, we use the table to summarize the techniques for large format modules of top five module makers. In terms of the size, one eighty two and two one zero. And for the bus bar, the numbers are quite. Different nine, ten, eleven, or twelve, but that doesn't matter that much in terms of the final power output. For the、um, design, this year for one eighty two is mostly seventy two pieces. For two one zero, it will be fifty, fifty five, and sixty pieces. And for next year, that really depends on whether the power output will continue to increase. If so, two one zero will go up to sixty and sixty six pieces. One eighty two, we will also see、uh, more pieces for package technology. We see、uh, narrow spacing and regular spacing are the mainstream, but Longjin and J Star they are introducing some new packaging technologies. And what's more. Obvious this year is the bifacial products market share in terms of ground power stations, especially in the U.S. Most、uh, power、uh, grounded stations will match up、uh, with、uh, bifacial. So the market share for bifacial has grown up from 20% to 40%. You'll see a large of large grounded station has increased their application of bifacial products. Bifacial modules. So next year we expect the market share of bifacial module to go up to around fifty percent. And in the future, all the、uh, large ground stations will adopt bifacial modules. So the ultimate market share will increase to about sixty percent. Okay, let me go to my conclusion. As mentioned in the beginning, which with larger format trending, one eighty two and two one zero. Have been developed at the same time. The two camps actually grow at the same pace for the second half of the year because there are more manufacturers doing、uh, larger format, and mostly of them focus on 182. So for this year, 182 will have a larger production capacity. In the long run, that really depends on the price and the strategy of manufacturers. For cell technology, Topcon and HGT. As I've mentioned, the equipment、uh, cost reduction has been quite obvious, and in the future, that really depends on the cost reduction of raw materials. For Topcon expansion, it will be larger、um, in the coming year because from Perk upgrade to Topcon,、um, there is a certain level of compatibility. But for SJT, it can it's not compatible to Perk and the Cost per watt is higher, so we can see the difference here. SJT, they have been working very hard in terms of、uh, reducing the cost, especially regarding the silver、uh, paste. So 
when the raw material become more mature in one or two years, we will see more significant level of cost reduction for HJT. Last but not least, for module technology, we see narrow spacing and regular spacing technology at this moment. In the future, Jin Ao and uh, JA Solar and uh, Longqi also introduce um, new technologies. And for anti products, we also see 180. The uh, two and uh, two one zero products and the power output go up to seven hundred watts. Last but not least, by facial module are estimated to grab forty percent of market share around the globe. We will see more and more bifacial projects are anticipated to use anti modules for their higher bifacial gain and better temperature performance. Okay, with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Next, I'll introduce our sales manager, Jackie, to talk about our new products. Distinguished participants online, I am a senior sales manager, Jackie Infolink to provide information for all our clients going to the latest market development and we'll be rolling out new products for 2021 we have the new infolink data factory and the infolink global energy storage report these will be two that we've launched for 2021 so before I go on about our new products I would like to give you a brief introduction of infolink we were established in 2017, and in the past few years, our research mostly covered new, new energy markets. As of today, renewable energy clients of Infolink come in at over 70 plus, and they are spread among uh, various countries in the world. Here, I've listed the major PV suppliers that are working with us. And over the past two or three years, we've also worked with uh, power station developers as well as joint ventures and investment houses. Therefore, you can see that in terms of our client, Infolink's client has actually spread to not just the manufacturers, but also investors and actual users. Next, I'd like to share with you the new products that we're launching this year, the Infolink Data Factory. This product allows us to connect to the current sales database and is basically an online system that is able to show the terminal demand as well as supply on the same panel. Through this interface, you would not need to flip through the different tabs and the different Excel tabs as in the past, but rather you can simply view all the information on the same panel and on the same screen. We also provide a search function that allows you to check, for example, capacity or uh, the background of a certain company or the technology levels of a certain country. And you can simply make that selection on the search bar and get the information that you need. And then the benefit of this system is that we can also provide real time and updated data. We were able to update information in a real time basis so that clients can get the latest information whenever they log into our system. Other than this benefit, you can see from the interface that you would actually be able to make comparisons among the various countries and markets. You can compare the various demands. You can do so, click on the bar chart with your mouse and the actual data would then be shown. So it's very user-friendly. Next, would also be updating the system and data when they're available. If you're using 
our product and this interface, you'll be able to get, as I've mentioned, the latest information, and you also get a analyst review on a quarterly basis. I believe such an interface would make it easier for clients to utilize our huge database. Next, we have a, a worksheet that I'd like to share with you and how it actually works. For example, if you look at this screenshot, let's say you, would, you are interested in learning about the polysilicon manufacturers in Xinjiang and their capacity, you can simply input the parameters and the interface will then show the names of the manufacturers, the quarterly capacity, and the actual data will then be shown directly. This would be the new product that we're launching for the PV side. Next, I would like to show with you the other product on energy storage that we are showing, which is the energy storage report. Uh, we've actually been preparing this report for over one year, and this has now officially launched. This will be updated every June and December, and we'll be seeing it officially launch this year, as it is, it is already officially launched. It will contain six major items, as you, mentioned, as you can see here on the slide, and will also be of use to um, members and parties in the PV industry. We expect this report to come out by Q4 this year. Next, I'd like to go deeper into the energy storage report. So from this page, you can see the profit model of the energy storage companies. In the renewable energy field, energy storage is a rather new endeavor, and people are interested in learning about the various ways energy can be stored. <coughs> Currently, there are over 20 types of energy storage methods, and we'll be looking at the various business models associated with these technologies. So on the next page, we'll be sharing a comparison of energy storage policies. And as with other types of markets, uh, it would definitely need a certain level of subsidies and the support in the first uh, few years and stages. So for China, we should be looking at various provinces as different provinces and local governments would have different policies to support the energy storage industry. Therefore, we'll be making a comparison of the various support policies. And this will be helpful for the manufacturers and also for the investors to have a better understanding of what kind of support and subsidy you can get at various regions. Other than policies, we'll also be looking at the global energy storage market estimations and outlook. Uh, we would have a, a pessimistic, neutral, and optimistic view that would be set for the global market. We'll also be sharing some key markets such as the US, Europe, and China. We'll also be showing the demands and capacity so to give you more information and a better idea of the, the global allocation. And of course, I'm sure you'll also be most interested in learning about the cost analysis, the future price forecast, etc. So our analysts would, of course, be providing a cost analysis and forecast for the battery storage market. And this will be able to provide you an outlook and a view. So we'll be looking at the lithium battery as well as the um, various Calling C types of energy storage as a market base. Other than looking at the various types of material used in energy storage, we'd also be providing an analysis on possible materials to be used in the future. This would 
be supplemented into electron control, battery system integration, as well as power systems. And we'll be looking at the manufacturers for each segment, as well as the various supply chains. We'll also be looking at the various case studies. On this slide, we have um, energy storage approach, projects around the world that's over 30 megawatts. Here I'd like to share with you uh, a point that I'm sure you're interested in, and that is the uh, calculated model and projections for the energy market. This would include both China and overseas market. In overseas market, we'll be listing, for example, the residential sector in Germany, residential sector in Japan, as well as the power sector in Germany, for example. I'll use this as an um, example to analyze analyze the economic benefits of energy storage. So these two are the two new products that Infolink is rolling out this year, and we will continue to maintain our customer first principle and make sure that we provide the most updated and top quality reports for you. Other than PV and energy storage, we actually also are looking to other Fields. We also have memory and mini and micro LED reports. So in the future, we will not just be focusing on energy, but we'll also be looking at other high-tech industries. And this would be the end of my report. I would now like to invite our analyst, Amy, to share with you the current um, outlook for PV supply and demand. Amy, please. Hi, distinguished participants. Hello, I'm Amy. I'd like to next focus on the outlook of the PV market. If you look at the recent market, of course, people are more concerned about the uh, price trends. And since the prices are currently at a higher level, will this actually impact the uh, domestic and overseas market? So I'll be looking at the market from a demand and supply and the supply side. We'll be looking at the reason why the prices went up in the past year, and we'll talk about the following trend. Next, I'd like to look at the demand side. If we go over the first half of 2020 very quickly, uh, we will recall that the outbreak of the pandemic was indeed brought a huge impact to the demands, and that has caused the demands to postpone to this year. If we look at last year, the expected demand was about 140 gigawatts last year, and this actually has caused a um, disruption in the upstream and downstream structures of the 2021 components. Therefore, the components prices has gone up, and we do see a possible possibilities of fluctuations this year. On the other hand, after the price increase last year, the US, Europe has actually been able to accept the higher prices. And we do see the deferred projects actually bringing in a stronger demand for China, we do still see a demand of 50 gigawatt. And overall this year, the demand we still expect to be at about 155 gigawatt, which is about 10% growth compared to the 140 gigawatt last year. For 2022, the main market has been supporting this will still be China, Europe, and the US. In the 14th five year project of China, they expect the growth to <coughs> be steady to about 65 gigawatts, uh, Europe and US will be about take about 15%, and the overall component demand will reach by about 12%, coming to 174 gigawatts. Therefore, if we look at the demand for 2020-2022, China's demand actually took about over 30% of the global market. Therefore, China is actually in a 
key indicator in terms of global demand. So let's look at the projects in China in this case. Since 2021, we see that auction projects led the market in the first half, but until the second half, uh, we've gone into the grid parity project era, and the increase in the raw materials, of course, caused the internal rate of return for terminal markets and terminal stations to come to 6% or even below. In May, the China's National Energy Administration has also issued that the deadline for grid connection in grid parity projects will be able to be extended to next year. And therefore, this actually has caused the price increases in the supply chain to abate slightly, considering that the local governments still have targets to meet and that PV stations will still make sure that the targets are met more or less this year, we don't see the demand to change that much. Uh, we do see also um, terminal manufacturers and component manufacturers talking about a delayed uh, turnover in terms of products, but currently only some projects have been delayed. So generally speaking, we do see the demand for parity projects decreasing slightly, but with the residential PV, in and enjoying a subsidy from the government, we expect the overall um, PV demand to be about 15 to 17 gigawatts. And with the guarantee new wind and solar capacity being no less than 90 gigawatts, we believe that for China, the domestic demand will likely only decrease from 50 gigawatt to, to from 55 gigawatt to 50 gigawatt domestically. Next, if we look at the quarterly demand starting from June, the uncertainty in the market, as well as the uh, expectations for July and August, has actually caused the manufacturers for batteries and components to be under pressure in terms of inventory, and therefore they've also decreased the supply and manufacturing activities. Therefore, we do see changes in the supply chain as well. So for July to August, we expect the market to still be seeing, uh, having reservations on the demand. But in Q3, we expect to see a stabilization. And for Q4, uh, we expect the demand to rebound and be at its highest. So for 2022, um, we see that the from the Chinese New Year till Q2, the terminal market will likely expect prices to fall and therefore demand would be lower. For China, we also see that the great priority projects will lead the second half of 2021. And other than increased inventory to prepare for the basic custom duties being levied in India, we don't see increased demand in the overseas market. Therefore, after the uh, off season for the first half, we expect for Q2, the stickle matter scarcity will likely be abated. But with such a long off season, the uh, components such as batteries that have a lower profit will likely be under pressure again, and therefore smaller to, and middle sized companies will likely um, face uh, more competition and make be difficult to survive. So for the second half of China, we do speak, expect the demand to go up on a quarterly basis. And in Q4, we see the hot season. So for 2022, we would be uh, seeing a demand rebound in the second half. Next, if we look at the orange bars, this would be the total capacity for silicon material. You can see that uh, not much new capacity is being released, only Yongxiang, about 80,000 tons in their new line for the second half of this year. And considering the ramp up period, this would not have a significant impact on the overall capacity output. And the uh, capacity impact will likely fall in Q1 next year. For a second half, I would like to look at the, or we have to pay more attention to the inventory. If we see the inventory piling up, then we do expect other companies moving into their maintenance period for the first half. Uh, Xingte and Yongxiang have already completed their uh, periodic maintenance. For the second half, the OCI Malay and Wacker from Germany also have plans to carry out maintenance. But 
Looking at the maintenance schedule, it seems to be quite spread out. Therefore, if you look at the overall capacity of silicon material can taking into the default <coughs> products, we should be able to supply components at about 170 gigawatts. And if you look at the blue bar, this should suffice for the demand. But to go, after going through what happened last year, um, the market is still under panic regarding a possible shortage of silicon material with various sizes and more customization in the batteries and components. This also creates additional pressure for inventory. Therefore, if we look at the uh, output demand from the downstream, we actually see the market be in a state of undersupply. However, this undersupply is not because of increased demand, but rather it's because of the supply side expectations. If we see the raw materials uh, for sickle price, <coughs> sickle raw material price to continue to grow to be at perhaps over 200 RMB per kilo. So uh, if we look at the uh, price, uh, for the, from next year, the price will likely uh, go down. For Q3, we do see uh, next year, for example, in the, in the price to go down. But for the first half, for example, Taco, East Hope Group, and ASEC would also be releasing new capacity. And with less demand in Q1 and Q2, we expect the price to go down. But for Q3, after the maintenance schedule, we do see the supply to go up on a quarterly basis. Of course, the high profits have also attracted new companies to expand. But considering that uh, single material actually costs at least over one and a half year to complete the initial implementation and factory installments, uh, the new capacity will likely come into the market at about 2023. Therefore, we believe that in 2023, silicon material would go back to the undersupply stage for the long term. Next, the Xinjiang issue is also a big issue that has hit the market. And the major impact here is that uh, the Hoshin Silicon was actually put under a withhold release order by the US by the end of June. And this company actually is a major manufacturer of the silicon, the raw silicon material industrial silicon. And this company actually produces about 70% of the global supply. Therefore, this would actually impact the companies that use Hoshin's uh, silicon material. And this would also impact those that are using uh, non Xinjiang manufacturers. We believe this actually has to do with how, if they were they're, they're able to provide a product. <clears throat> certificate of origin, that is, if the companies cannot prove that they are not using silicon products from Hoshi Silicon, then it is possible that they would be unable to export the products to the US because of the withhold order, or it would actually, or the products might be withheld at customs. Therefore, uh, so companies are already thinking whether they would be recalling the products that have already been exported or that or that have already left port, as it is possible that they will be withheld and seized when they arrive. But looking at the future, a lot of the companies are still thinking of ways. That is, they need to find ways to um, to. They have to need to find ways to convince the U.S. customs, and this actually shows that companies that are vertically integrated are at an advantage, especially for the A silicon companies and the other integrators that do not use Xinjiang's multi silicon. So we do see uh, benefits and advantages for those companies that are vertically integrated, and the impact, of course, also impact. Uh, areas other than the U.S. because this was also impact the U.S. investors. If we look at projects in Europe, where the hearing developers requiring suppliers to use non-Xinjiang Bay man <coughs> or materials that are not of Xinjiang origin, 
So we need to wait <clears throat> and see uh, how the policy develops. But if we look at it from two various scenarios, that is for scenario one, that is the multi-silicon companies are able to provide a product of origin certificate. So if the impact is about 20%, to the downstream companies, then looking at the demand in the US and Europe, we believe that the supply for silicon material is still sufficient for the second half. We expect about 80 gigawatt being able to be supplied. If we look at 2022, we'll still see a supply of 193 gigawatt of silicon material. But if we look at scenario two, and that is, the withheld order actually covers not just Hoshin, but also the other five listed companies. Then in terms of the global silicon material supply, the second half of 2021 will actually come to 52 gigawatts. And for 2020, for 2021's second half, it would like to come to 52 gigawatts. And for 2022, it would like 130 gigawatts. And this is still sufficient to meet the demands in Europe and the US. But as I've already mentioned, it is possible that companies will prefer to use silicon material and multi silicon material that are not of Xinjiang origin. So therefore, this would likely uh, be an issue in terms of supply. And this also likely cause a price difference in terms of silicon material from Xinjiang and not from Xin, those not from Xinjiang. So next we will look at the price trend for July to August. We do see the demand being uh, low and the downstream companies actually have been uh, lowering the utilization rate in order to um, try to balance in terms of the price uptrend. But currently speaking, we don't see a significant pressure in terms of the silicon material inventory. Therefore, we see it actually, uh, see the market being currently stuck in a rut and the parties mostly still have reservations regarding the price change. So we don't see the price going up significantly in June to July. And it's likely to be between 20, 200 to 210 RMB per kilo in the short term. But of course, we need to revise that based on the maintenance schedule of the manufacturers. So looking at the future in terms of supply for Q3 and Q4, as I've said, the maintenance schedule is rather spread out. But in terms of the inventory uh, stock up, we anticipate other suppliers to carry out maintenance as well. And the price has already cooled down for Q3. We believe these silicon material supply is still enough to support the wave need for wave manufacturing. And therefore we expect the price to maintain the current level without significant spikes. As for the next year, uh, we do see the supply going up on a quarterly basis and combined with a lower demand for the first half. However, the price will likely change after the inventory is piled up after the Chinese New Year. And we expect the prices to go down more significantly. But of course, the um, outlier issue here is the Xinjiang issue. And for the short term, uh, we'll have to pay close attention to the whether the, the Xinjiang uh, issue would actually impact the price. So starting from 2023 with the major suppliers uh, expanding the capacity and opening up new lines, we believe that from 2023, the price and profits would be low again as the supply would be significantly over exceed demand. Next, in terms of the size, we see Rongji and several other companies such as uh, Zhong, such as Zhonghuan and uh, Jinko expanding their capacity. And we're also seeing medium-sized companies such as the Wuxi Shangji Automation, Solar Giga, JYT, STS Tech, or Yongxiang having their own expansion plans. And 
with Gaoqing and Shuangli actually increased capacity, uh, we expect the overall capacity by the end of this year for wafers to be at least over 300 gigawatts. The excess capacity would actually make it difficult for smaller companies to make it in the market. And since for second material, most of the orders are placed uh, for long term, therefore it is difficult to get new orders. So we expect that smaller suppliers in the market will be eliminated from this year to next year. And we're also seeing <coughs> it being more difficult for overseas suppliers competing with China in terms of price for companies like French, for like for companies in France and Korea, uh, where they have requirements for uh, low carbon footprint wafers. So uh, overseas companies like Norsen, NCACC, or Wujing will likely still be able to get orders for these low carbon footprint wafers. And of course, with the Xinjiang issue, perhaps this would provide room in the market for these overseas companies. And generally speaking, uh, we do see the capacity increase to have an impact on the price, uh, but eventually the supply would exceed demand. And <clears throat> this would likely end the price hike for um, second materials. So the, currently the prices are at a high level, but starting from Q3 with new capacity from these uh, new companies, um, as well as a very likely oversupply in the future, we do see that the profit would likely be shared with the downstream companies. And it's possible that this would actually provide pressure on the uh, upstream, and therefore it is unlikely that the wafers or silicon wafers would increase in price in line with the silicon materials. And with the ex increase in capacity for monosilicon wafers, we also see the uh, supply for wafers exceeding the demand for the terminal component companies. And with the price of the monosilicon wafers going down, the tier two companies gross profit will likely go back to a single digit. And it will also be difficult for them to make ends meet in the off season. So, so we do see this uh, downstream pressure being rippled upwards. So starting from Q4, we do expect these mid to small size companies having only a very minimum profit. As for April to May, we actually see the price being stabilized, but for the major uh, demand markets such as India, it is also impacted by the pandemic. And therefore we do see the price going down. So compared to the price in May, you will see that this is already a 15% decrease and we actually see the price continue to go down. So for polysilicon wafers, we expect the, some of the capacity to be decreased and actually move out of the market. Next, in terms of the battery, or cell supply, um, we still see that the mainstream products will be the P-type perk cells. So, but with the uh, low profits, if we look at Q1, it has actually fallen down to one to 3% as there's a significant uh, oversupply. And with a low profit and, and the unlikely possible possibility of the price going up. Uh, a lot of these suppliers have actually decreased the utilization rate to 60 to 70 percent in order to change the capacity release level. For Q2 to Q3, uh, I think only uh, Tongwei and Ico have projects going on, whereas most of the other companies actually have put their projects on hiatus. If you look at the future capacity growth, uh, they're actually decreasing investments in the P-type perk cells and uh, reserving room for the N-type. Some companies have also moved into an expansion for the N-type cells. Therefore, 
we are seeing a uh, limited supply for these companies. And other than changing the utilization rate, uh, closing down the, the aged uh, manufacturing lines, we're also seeing uh, companies that have been integrated vertically to eliminate the um, aging products. And also see uh, product lines that are fixed on small sizes and product lines that cannot be upgraded to be eliminated start from Q3. So considering that the needs for Q1, uh, we expect uh, this to go on in Q2 and Q3. And also seeing tier two companies starting to move to the 166 or 166 millimeter sizes. So start looking at this year, uh, to be pretty conservatively, the capacity will still likely be at about 180 to 200 gigawatts, but we don't see this uh, oversupply trend to change much. It also be difficult for the uh, polysilicon cells to continue to sell, and the prices also likely to go up. So it is likely to see companies actually uh, move the polysilicon manufacturing lines out of the cycle in the future. Next, in terms of prices, the cell companies actually do not have a lot of chips to uh, discuss prices with the buyers. So in May, uh, we see a lot, of, a lot of component companies stopping the procurement and also don't see that many uh, small to medium sized companies stocking up on inventory. Therefore, in June, we do see the inventory pressure reappear for the cell and in July to August, with lower demand and the market having reservations, we expect the price for uh, sales to decrease by the second half of June. And this will also move upwards to the wafers. In terms of the wafer price, we should see it going down. And the price for sales actually is currently the counting. However, for the up half of July, we see that the price is still going to going down and has actually um, gone down lower than uh, one RMB per watt. So we have to be more conservative as um, the companies already have a certain inventory and the vertical integrated companies actually are able to suffice based on their own inventory. So looking at domestic demand, uh, we do see a possible increase by the second half of August, and likely some purchases will start to continue in July to August, but it is likely that the prices will go up much, and it's possible that they would barely be able to make ends meet, as the profit for sales is already very low, and it will actually even make fall further, called, along with the price decreases in wafers. So it will be a slow decrease. So, and for Q3 to Q4, we still see a sporadic orders from overseas. But if you look at the G1 cells, since it's limited by the price of the wafers, we believe that the consideration of the higher cost, the price of these cells will still continue to go down. And with the size moving to the larger size types in the second half, the N6 sales would also not see much sale starting from June uh, with a very low profit level. However, in China, uh, there are still some projects that have installation targets. And in this conversion stage, it would likely see some increased profit for these um, end of stage products or, or products close to the ending era. Now for Q4 with uh, it being the hot season for installations, M6 sales will likely see a slight increase in terms of profits. Considering the large scale stations projects uh, for the second half, it will move to the 182 and 210 size. So for the second half this year, we expect the profit for sales to be only about three to 6%. And in the future, 
um, the competition will sort of depend on the pricing policies for wafers in the upstream. In terms of the expansion, we do see uh, companies still moving forward and it will likely come to over 400 gigawatt this year. So we do see in terms of uh, inventory from January to May, uh, a conservative outlook would be about 25 to 30 gigawatt of inventory on the component side. So in terms of the current inventory, uh, we do see that the price increase to slow down for the supply and the prices is already seeing a slight drop. So in terms of module capacity, we see increases in not just China, but also in Southeast Asia. The purpose, of course, would be to, to move upwards the size and types and also seeing expansions. But because of the pandemic, uh, we see the expansion speed slowing down for Southeast Asia. But with all the projects in place, uh, we still expect to see the capacity for Southeast Asia to greatly exceed the demands for the US. And therefore, we'll see the um, aging machines and production lines being uh, phased out for the Southeast Asia companies. In terms of price, with the price hike for silicon material this year, the component company suppliers have also been forced to um, hike up their prices. However, in terms of the sales agreement, since it takes time, therefore it will not reflect the price changes as quickly. And this will actually cause the profit for these component manufacturers to decrease. So currently, the price has actually um, changed for the components of over 500 watts. It's currently about 1.76 to 1.79 RMB per watt. That is for the monofacial modules. And for the distributed transport order, this trade about uh, on just 1.78 to 1.79 RMB per watt. And that's about 0 0.245 to 0 0.25 US dollars. And that's a uh, current uh, balance in terms of the market. As mentioned, the price change for overseas should not be reflected as quickly. Therefore, it's currently at, as mentioned, 0 0.245 to 0 0.25 US dollar. Without further fluctuations, uh, we would see the uh, volatility overseas to be not as severe. And taking into consideration that there are still inventories. So for the uh, 500 watt plus components, we expect the price to be about 1.63 RMB per watt, which is about 0 0.224 US dollar. But certainly from Q2, we expect the single material price to go down. So it's likely that the component suppliers and manufacturers will also be able to lower their price. So by next year, we do expect, but by this time in next year, we do expect the price to go down again. And the overseas would be at 0 0.22 to 0 0.225 US dollars. So finally, uh, in conclusion, in terms of the overall demand and supply, the orange line would be demand and for suppliers we're only putting the tier one suppliers. So what you can see here is that for the silicon material supplies for this year, um, it's actually rather tight. The reason is because of the installation period of one to one and a half year in terms of new capacity expansions. But for the second half of this year, of course, um, the production only takes about three to six months. Therefore, there's actually this discrepancy between the uh, facility installment and the actual production uh, requirement. And we are seeing uh, companies moving into the maintenance phase for the second half. 
And in Q4, we do see the prices going up. But if you look at the wafer prices, because of the changes in terms of the sizes and policies, we're still seeing additional expansion projects and plans. And this will expand to the large size wafers for Q3 with additional capacity. We do see the wafer price also uh, we first also go into oversupply in Q3, and this will likely be difficult for them to reflect the cost chain increases in the next quarter. The gross profit will likely go back to the single digit profit level. As for sales, in terms of the supply chain, you can see that it's a significant oversupply, but of course, it depends on the uh, wafers uh, price changes. So for this quarter, uh, we do see it going down significantly. And with additional capacity being released, it's very difficult for the price to go back up. So for Q2 to Q3 this year, uh, we are indeed seeing companies uh, slowing down their expansion plans. And this would, of course, uh, be a benefit to the advantage of those companies that are able to integrate the upstream and downstream. And for the mid to long term, this would actually be a bigger impact for the small to medium sized suppliers. Therefore, the smaller suppliers and the suppliers with older production lines will likely be forced out of the market. So we do see the bigger companies growing bigger and the tier two and tier three suppliers likely being forced off the market. If you look at the future price trends, after the market price change um, next year, we will go back into the oversupply stage. And this would be uh, the end of my report. So this would be the end of Oh, the photovoltaic PV market. I would like to now invite Fang Wei to share with us the energy storage market. Fang Wei, please. English guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yuan Fang Wei. Um, energy storage analyst and InfoLink. In the past two years, the losing battery energy storage market has been driven by energy transition issues and the outbreak of the EV market. Therefore, today I want to share with you the development trends of the losing battery energy storage market. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction on grids and energy storage. Then I will talk about uh, energy storage policies and prospects and market forecasts for lithium battery energy storage, followed by the ESS cost examination and price forecast, industry change and major relevant enterprises and case studies and behind the meter markets. Firstly, uh, we need to understand why energy storage systems need to be added into the energy transition. There are several important factors. First, because renewable energy sources are intermittent energy sources, such as wind and light. Secondly, when these renewable energy sources account for more than 30% and are re replaceable, the power grid will easily cause blackouts, which will have a huge impact on the economy. Thirdly, increase the utilization rate of renewable energy solve the loss of wind and light and transmission and make good use of every kilowatt hour of electricity. Therefore, uh, various factors indicate that energy storage must be added to the grid. On the right-hand side, the you can see that the grid can be divided into three parts. The power generation side, power grid side, and the user side. Uh, each part can incorporate energy storage. We see each part 
uh, can be incorporated into any storage. At the same time, the power grid mode will also change from a traditional centralized power grid to a distributed power grid. The biggest feature is that there is still high power selectivity and flexibility on the user side. In other words, individual users can also control power generation and power consumption. Well, use China's average wind and solar energy curtailment rate in 2020. For, as an example, it is about 3% in 2020. And the more serious the problem is in the Northwest inland, such as uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Qinghai. The wind and solar energy curtailment rate is more than 10% in this region. Even if there's good renewable energy power generation environment, if there's no suitable grid and energy storage application, it will just become another type of power curtailment and increase the cost of power generation. So this problem also clearly reflects the importance of energy storage in the grid. Okay, these are the types of energy storage systems. It can be divided into five categories based on their properties, such as electricity, machinery, and electrochemistry. There are more than 10 energy storage system technology currently in use, and each system has its own advantages and disadvantages. Among them, we're based on two more critical conditions. One is storage time, the other is system energy storage and then compare and map with different application modes in the power grid. We can see the application covered by electrochemical energy storage has the widest range, which is one of the reasons why lithium battery energy storage will attract everyone's attention. And of course, when entering a new industry or a new field, how to make a profit is always the most concerned issue. And energy storage has more than 20 different profit models on the entire grid. For example, on the generation side, it's mainly fine-tuned peak frequency modulation or regulation, peak shaving, um, black start, and also auxiliary services. On the user side, it increased different uh, modules or carbon emission and for example, Tesla is a very good example. Tesla's sale of corporate carbon emission in the past few years has brought considerable profits to its companies, which is a good profit case in the external environment because each EV is a small energy storage uh, device. So it is a very good example of external environment profit model. In terms of policy, we also use China as an example. In most provinces, uh, they have relevant policies corresponding to energy storage. Some have um, requirements on power stations. For example, for the newly installed wind and PV power stations require more than 5 to 20% of energy storage construction and the required provinces continue to expand. The compulsory policy is bound to have some negative impact on the construction of renewable energy, but only with the state reforms and changes can promote the industry to become more mature and grow further. Okay, now in this table, we can see the policies of different Chinese provinces. For the uh, generation side, the uh, front of meter market, we see a more comprehensive policy, which is very important for a market started to do ESS. But on the user side, it is less mature, which is um, understandable because it, it is concerned with more business model or behavior. And for most countries, it is difficult for them to develop this part of the model. Of course, for energy storage policies, we have seen corresponding policies in different countries. For example, in China, it is 
at a relatively early stage of energy storage development. So we have some more uh, comprehensive policy for before the meter, front of the meter uh, session. But for more mature countries like Korea and uh, Japan, they have policies for the uh, other part of the system. Okay, next, let's talk about ESS market. When we talk about this, we have to start with renewable energy. According to the current renewable energy related policies target by various countries, the, gov the global renewable energy volume will exceed 3,000 gigawatts by 2030. However, based on actual conditions and the current development speed, we predict the actual installed volume of renewable energy will exceed 5,000 gigawatts by 2030. Among them, PV account for more than 50%, followed by land, wind, close to 40%. So after a large amount of renewable energy is integrated into the power grid, it also means that sufficient energy storage systems are needed before and after the meter. Therefore, the energy storage market has an amazing growth potential in the next decade. A lithium battery, why you can develop so well during the past few years, uh, it has a lot to do with the rise of electric vehicles. The global market for EV sold more than 2 million units in 2019, and EV battery installation exceeded 100 gigawatt hour. Although the development has slowed down this year, uh, last year due to the pandemic, we're still optimistic that by 2025, the global market of EV will reach 12 million units and the installed battery capacity will be more than 700 gigawatt hour. Under this market situation, the price of lithium batteries has dropped by 90% in the past 10 years. From uh, 1200 US dollar to 150 US dollar. And the energy density, energy density also increased by 50% during the past two or three years. And because of the price uh, cut down and the efficiency uh, increase, we see more application of lithium uh, battery applications. In terms of the global energy storage market sell forecast, we analyze and predict the amount of wind and solar renewable energy installed combined with different energy storage penetration rates. So there are three predictions, optimistic, neutral, and pessimistic. By 2025, from neutral to um, pessimistic, the construction uh, capacity will be 190 to 250 gigawatt hour. And in terms of uh, geographic distribution, U.S. has always been the leader. The percentage, the share of U.S. is more than 50%. And in the next few years, it's very difficult to surpass the share of the U.S. From the chart on the upper left, China market has been growing rapidly during the past few years. By 2025, we predict that the market size of China will be similar to the United States. In 2025, China, US, and Europe, the market share of these three markets will exceed 80% of the global market. A lot of Asian great industries or enterprises, uh, they have installed, they have started to build capacity in the US uh, in response to this trend. For China market, since uh, the history of developing energy storage system has been relatively short. And also due to the pandemic, by 2022, we will not expect a too, much, too much of a growth or too fast of a growth. But it is predicted that in 2025, the accumulated uh, energy storage uh, will, ex will reach about 60 gigawatt hour. Okay, next, um, let me do a brief introduction on lithium battery storage and price analysis. So what are the major components of the energy storage system? 
the cell, core cell, is the key. In addition to that, we need to have EOS, DOS, or ABC, and the energy management system, and have the uh, device to convert the direct current to alternate current through the transformer and inverter. For the uh, price, we can see that for the first 10 years before 2020, you can see that the price dropped uh, significantly and the industry become increasingly concentrated. And from 2020 to 2030, the global competition intensified after price reduction slowed down. It can be divided into two parts, NCN and LFP. We expect that this year, ESS system, the cost per watt is about 250 to 280 US dollar. We expect that in the next decade, we expect a reduction of about 40%. For the cost will be lower to 160 US dollars per kilowatt hour. So in view of that, whether for NCN or FFP, the price difference will also become narrower in the future. Okay, after we learn about the price and the market, how should we know how uh, whether they can be applied to the market? And the easiest way to do the evaluation is to evaluate the cost. Currently, for lithium battery, the LCOE is about 0.1 US dollar. For some countries or regions, is already economic viable. And we also see some countries, uh, there is some, um, uh, the, 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 the price has to go up to 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. So that's why uh, we are seeing these uh, efficiency, but it is being applied widely and globally, this level is not enough. So we expect that by 2025 to 2030, uh, it could be a goal, reduced to uh, 0 0.05 or below that level. And the, with the growth of the uh, EV market and the ESS market, this will also have an impact on the market. So many enterprises or governments have recognized these issue. Therefore, at the end of last year, U.S. has announced the energy storage market. We expect to lower the price to 0 0.03 to 0 0.05 U.S. dollar. And also, Tesla, on the battery day last year, they expect to uh, further reduce the cost of the lithium battery in terms of cell design, innovations for cell production lines, et cetera, they hope to accelerate the speed by, uh, to the extent that the cost will be half of 2020 by 2025. And we are optimistic about this trend because if the price go down further, it will contribute to the growth of the energy storage market. Okay, next I would like to talk about the industry chain and major companies. The, we divided the energy storage industry chain to uh, five major sectors from leasing battery raw materials to battery packs to grid connected application from cell module, PCS, system integration, project development, less but not least, electricity trades, platform and services. As you can see, um, this is more of uh, critical and the before the meter market. And we can also see the market leaders. They have different um, practices in terms of battery. 
most of the uh, market leaders are Asian countries in China, Japan, and Korea. And for China, the percentage is more than 60%. For PCS or electric control, China, Europe, or US, they have their own market leaders, especially for China. During the past few years, we see a lot of system integrators uh, emerge during the past two or three years. In terms of project development, we see more European and US companies. It's because the development of energy storage has been more mature in these regions. That's why we are seeing more business model in this area. Okay, uh, we've mentioned that system integrator is the core of the um, industry chain. So system integration and project development are key segments that basically all mainstream companies are all involved. Company, if they want to join this segment, there are several different ways. Number one, they are up and mainstream companies they can do this through a uh, corporation. So like uh, SunGrow or other companies, they belong to these uh, area. And there are professional integrators that have been accumulated long-term experiences and technical capabilities such as HyperStrong. The other type is electricity, renewable energy trading platform, such as Fluence and Sonnet. As we know, uh, everybody wants to get into these segments. So if you want to uh, get your share in the market, it's not that easy. You need a lot of technical background and experiences. Here, I've listed some of the requirements for system integrators. For example, they need to know the application scenario, uh, customer demand, required technology of each segment, and access, uh, purchasing ability of each segment in the supply chain of company. For example, last year or H1, lithium battery used in ES market, uh, it takes a long time to get the shipment. So if the delivery time takes too long, it will also affect the company's reputation. Of course, experience is also very important, operation maintenance and branding. So to grab the market as a system integrator is not that easy. You will also be affected by a lot of uh, market chaos impeding developments. For example, low price competition and even technology development with huge differences. Secondly, there are no specific regulations or inspection standards. These challenges or market chaos will also affect the market's development. We'll use uh, SunGrow as an example how to transform from a PV inverter manufacturer to the number one energy storage integrator. On the uh, official website, you know that started with PV inverters. They enter the uh, PV power station system since 2013. In, there are several uh, key time uh, milestones. In 2013, it started with PV inverter manufacturing and engaged in PV station system integration business. Since 2013, it has accumulated some technology and experiences. In 2014, it partnered with uh, Samsung KSDI for a joint venture of energy storage battery and uh, manufacturing. From this process, we have uh, listed out some key factors of how to successfully um, transform itself. Number one, it has accumulated its own technology and market share. Secondly, it entered the industry early and gradually accumulated experience by joint venture with tier one companies such as Samsung SDI. Thirdly, it uh, number four, it gradually developed product across the entire grid, covering uh, generation side, 
grid side and user and user side. And next, uh, I would like to share with you some uh, cases and uh, assessments. Firstly, let's start with the uh, electricity prices in China. In order to promote the growth of energy storage industry, uh, especially in China, they will try to uh, focus on the uh, value electricity prices. Another factor is that for great industry in China, there is a um, uh, demand uh, price. So if you can focus on this area, uh, you will bring a lot of benefit to the great industry. Here we use uh, great enterprise and general industry in Beijing as an example. For great industry, the cost of demand is a high proportion of the electricity, electricity bill. In, after that has been deducted, the cost recovery period can be as short as four years. If the cost of demand is not controlled well, if it stays at about 50%, the recovery period will, about, will be about six years. But six years is still a very good number. But for general industry, if they do not have the demand for a cost, of, if that they do not have the cost of demand issue, the benefit of energy storage will be uh, much lower. The recovery period will be close to eight years. When we do the assessment and evaluation, for PV, uh, how PV system and ESS can save the electricity cost. Uh, number one is to for PV system to reduce peak hour usage. And for ESS, I uh, focus on the demand charge or peak value price differences. Let's use uh, Qinghai as an example. The subsidy level is based on the uh, local policy. After the energy storage system is adopted with some auxiliary services and after we solve the PV curtailment issue, the recovery period is still as high as nine years. That's why for many industries in China, unless it is strongly required by the policy, they are reluctant to develop the energy uh, storage on the power generation side, since the benefit is not that huge. And many of these uh, projects are pilot projects. It is actually very critical to the uh, grid. We hope that in the future, we can have more auxiliary services to bring more economy benefits and skills in the future. Okay, uh, for the user size business model, actually we see a very diverse and underdeveloped business models. Buy up is the most traditional model. End user purchases ESS from manufacturing according to own needs and the benefit will be the lowest. After that, we see a rental and sharing model. Energy storage developers and users will share the benefit or share the revenue generated from the ESS. And we see further development of a community model when we see a microgrid or a community grid. Each the development of each model represents the progress of the market and the change of business models. Let's use uh, Sonet as an example. And the biggest characteristic is that the users, they share the electricity and they don't no longer need to pay for electricity. For example, when there are excess power generated in A, 
the power will be transmitted to uh, location B for them to use. And when they have these so net energy storage device, uh, they may pay a monthly subscription fee. The company will be able to provide a certain quota of uh, free power. It could be uh, as low as 4,000 kilowatt hour to more than uh, 12,000 kilowatt hours. That's the free consumption quota per year, which will attract the subscribers to install the energy storage devices. For next example is the Enel X. They have proposed the idea of virtual grid and smart grid from EV to family to enterprises to the city. It could be developed into a business model. These uh, parts circle in yellow. I believe they are also have great potential in China. One is uh, eBus the storage station and the CNI energy storage and green payment. We already seen some business model of green payment in some countries or regions. And China is the leader of mobile payments. So I believe that in the future, in terms of green payment, China will be able to see a lot of development in the business model and present a lot of uh, creativity. Last but not least, I would like to um, touch upon the ESS security regulations. In 2018 to 2019, we have seen many South incidents in South Korea, which caused a lot of concern, not just for uh, batteries, but also on EVs. So people have a lot of uh, worries and concern about the lithium batteries. But so far we are seeing more and more government policies or regulations on the battery or EV, not just from the system module or material. We also see policies related to the final energy storage system and grid connection requirements. So in order to ensure the safety and related regulations continue to increase and optimize in the future, when security is improved, we will be able to see more product choices Last but not least, in terms of the conclusion, we predict that global renewable energy capacity will exceed 5,000 gigawatt by 2030, estimated according to current trends and governmental programs. And we also predict that by 2025, the cumulative storage capacity in the world will be 200 gigawatt, uh, gigawatt hours and 55 gigawatt hours in China. Secondly, in present, prices for leasing battery ESS sit at about 250 to 300 US dollars. Given governmental policies and actions of companies, the prices will decline to 150 to 180 kilowatt hour by 2025 to 2030. System integration is a crucial segment in the ESS industry chain, being sought after everyone. We see SunGrow stepping in from PCS, CATL from the angle of battery cell. HyperStrong is the system integrator itself. And so then um, start from integration uh, developing. China is a market with great potential as its great industries can utilize ESS to reduce demand charges. With appropriate designs, it can shorten ESS payback period to four to five years. Energy storage business modes models are an intriguing and underdeveloped field. Solar ACDC integrated charging piles for EVs, behind the meter, CNI, green payments, and trading platforms all have great potentials. Last but not least, system security is an interlocking issue that requires layers of supervisions and is not determined by one single material. We believe that with advanced technologies and more experiences, uh, security problems of these batteries, of these products will be ultimately resolved. Okay, with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Next, we'll be entering the QA session. If you have any questions, please post your question in the chat room. Thank you.
对对对对对嗯 ，Hello， 大家好，我是 Corinne。呃，接下来 Q&A 的环节会我这边来主持。那我们的分析 ，Hello， this is Corinne。I will be。This is Corinne。This is Corinne。I will be leading the Q&A session， and therefore I will be answering the questions first， and then we have Amy answer the related questions on PV， and Fang will be answering questions on energy。Storage. So, uh, we'll be listing the questions in the chat, and also be providing a survey for you in the chat. Please take some time to fill out the survey so that we know how to improve. So, first off, um, it is like uh, since we already have received a lot of questions, we might not be able to answer all of them. Uh, feel free to ask the questions via email as well, and we'll be able to reply in, via email as well. So, so the first is uh, regarding the n-type cells. Is there a suitable size? We we'll believe that. Okay. So feel feel free to ask to to share with us email. So in terms of the technical questions, because the first question is, what is the suitable size for the n-type cells? But we believe that for this year, one six six is on the more mainstream. And compared to the previous years, 166 will likely be more mainstream. In the past, it was 158 or 156, but this year, 166 will become mainstream. But of course, we believe that we will definitely move towards 182 and 2110 in the future. But which is more suitable? Uh, there's no fixed answer for this. But why we say that? Uh, the end type would be moving to a large sizes next year. It's because of a scarcity in silicon material this year, and it'd be difficult for the large size cells to maintain their quality if there's a scarcity of silicon material. So we believe that the quality of large size cells will likely be more stable once we see a stable supply of silicon material. So for a Topcom or HJT, the expansions would definitely take into consideration the large sized productions. Okay, next, uh, next question is, what is the mainstream BB type for the 182 cells? Well, if we look at the tier one for 182, there are 9 BB, 10 BB, and 11 BB, and we don't see it um, unifying anytime soon, as this would depend on the design of the cells as well as the selection of components. So we believe that 9, 10, and 11 would all likely become mainstreams, uh, they would not be unified in the short term. Okay. Next, uh, the next question is, do we have any forecast on the N-type cells? Well, for this part, of course, we also have a price forecast as with the P-type, but it's not mentioned in the report. So if you would like to learn about our forecast for the N-type cells, uh, feel free to message us in private. Next, uh, we're seeing PECVD technology for Topcom, and people are asking what is the ratio between LPCVD and PECVD? We believe that if you look at the Topicon suppliers, they are mostly LPCVD, and PECVD is actually going to be online this year. So if you look at the ratio, the current ratio is quite uh, significant. But if you look at the next year, well, LPCVD is actually more mature, but of course, there's still room for improvement. But for PECVD, we believe it has a higher prospect in the future. However, the technology is not mature enough. So it's still difficult to determine the ratio next year. But rather, we have to look at the expansion plans this year for these major companies, and we can make that determination based on their expansion choices. So these would be the more technical related questions. Uh, we might not, as mentioned, we may not have time to answer all of them, but feel free to uh, shoot us an email and we will answer them via email. Next, I would like to invite Amy to give reply the questions on demand and supply. Um, 
Hello， 大家，我是 Amy。然后我这边 Hello， this is Amy. Uh, I have already gone over the questions, and let's first look at the uh, first question is the, about the, how is the maintenance schedule planned? Well, basically, for silicon material producers, uh, they would actually have to uh, get a annual maintenance, annual repair, and this will depend on when they carried out the repair last year. And this schedule is determined by the production schedule and the orders received. So if we look at 2021, Yongxiang Dachuan Co, uh, these companies or the major companies have already completed the annual maintenance for Q3. Xixing will actually begin its maintenance, and for OCM Malay and Wacker in Germany would also have. Uh, maintenance plan schedule. So our current observation is that for the second half of this year, the maintenance schedule is a bit spread apart. But in July to and August, if we see inventory of silicon material piling up, then we believe that there will be more companies uh, actually scheduling an annual maintenance in the following months to decrease production. Okay, the next question is, for Q4, the production has exceeded Q3, but in Q4, the supply is also quite high. Why is the price lower in Q4 compared with Q3? Uh, if we look at the supply side, that is between Q3 and Q4, we do see the utilization go rate going down. Therefore, in terms of supply, if you look at our presentation, uh, it was a slight increase in terms of supply. So although the inventory level is still quite low, the pressure at the downstream has already tripled upwards to the wafer suppliers. Therefore, they're actually controlling the supply via the utilization rate at the factory. Therefore, the sale price and the wafer price actually do not see a lot of room for increases in this case. Therefore, the pressure actually is moving from the downstream companies to the upstream. And therefore, this is why we're seeing uh, a balance here. And as for Q4, the supply would slightly increase, as I've mentioned. But if the price for single material still goes up in Q4, then that would definitely continue to impact the supply. Therefore, if we look at the future price trend for sickle material, we don't see a sick of room for price hikes, but we need to pay attention to the Xinjiang issue as that would likely be a bigger impact. Next, for sickle wafers, uh, people are asking about the price of the sickle wafer for polysickle wafers in August and September. Well, the demand is low in June and July because people are waiting for the uh, policies in India to reach an end by the end of July. And therefore, in terms of the exports, it's currently under pressure. The wafer price is also starting to go down and people, of course, would buy it at a low price point and not a high price point. So the market is uh, still observing and with the policies coming to an end, there would likely be an open window as the new tax policies, people are still waiting for the new tax policies. So we believe it will be still be at about 1.9 RMB per wafer in September, at, and that's likely to be a more stable price. Next, so for components, uh, what is the reason for the component price decrease in Q1? Well, the reason is that for the midstream suppliers, they also have more downstream channels. So when they were signing the contracts for the next year, we do see the price uh, going through some changes. If we look at the prices for over 500 watts, it's about 1.76 to 1.78. Uh, that's and it's slowly going down. Next is for 500 watts price. It's between 1.64 to 1.65. Is it for the end of this year? Uh, no, it's actually referring to June of 2022. That is the same period next year. Okay, I still see another question. Is it for component suppliers? What is the capacity plans? 
Well, let's look at the utilization rate. From July to August, the utilization rate would likely go up a bit because of the domestic projects in China in September and also of the uh, expected demand increase in Q4. So it's possible that the capacity would go up. Of course, this is if there are no further uh, impacts in the supply side. If we look at uh, tier one suppliers, uh, supply, we actually do not see them uh, downward revising the overall supply. So for Q1, Q2, uh, it was, uh, the demand was weaker and we expect this to pick up in Q3 and Q4. And that's why we don't see a change in terms of the overall supply from these tier one companies. Okay, next I'd like to ask if I found way to answer the questions on energy storage. Hello, dear participants. Okay, so question, the first question is regarding the energy storage system from double edge, that is, if it goes from two RMB double edge, fall, if it falls down to 1.5 RMB, then the profit will be quite significant, right? Per what hour? Well, actually, this would depend on the uh, stage you're referring to, as the profit level per stage would definitely be different, as this would actually change. But if you look at the power generation side, this would be different. And you just have to look at the uh, difference between the uh, peak and the valley as they want to uh, make amend during the valley. Uh, so, speaking, of course, a decrease in cost would be, of course, most impactful. But in terms of profit level, you have to look at the different stages. And if you look at the actual application, they will determine the actual profit level. Okay, the second question would be about the uh, cost decrease paths for energy storage. And what are the main concerns? Well, the lithium battery will take about 50 to 60% of the cost, and the main implication will be in electric vehicles. Therefore, uh, this will definitely be impacted by the electric vehicle market. So our indicator would be um, the uh, lithium batteries usage in electrical cars. And of course, also we look at the raw material. We would also look at the uh, trends in the next five to 10 years, we see this to be rather uh, stable. It will not decrease very quickly in the next five to 10 years because with improvements in technology, um, of course, this would also mean uh, a slight decrease in terms of cost. Okay, another question, so talk about the difference between the valley and the peak is because of the high peak and low valley or because the downward revisions are at the different speeds. Well, we actually see both possibilities or both happening in the past and they have both occurred. If you're interested, you can actually look at the actual data because I got this data from the uh, local information from the various provinces. Uh, I have not carried out an in-depth comparison over the years, but if you're interested, I will be able to get the data and make the calculation for you and do that calculation for you. All right, these would be the questions on the energy storage side. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this would be the end for the Q&A session. I understand there are still many questions that have been unanswered and we'll be answering them via email and in person. So uh, as mentioned, uh, we have provided a survey for you and a questionnaire. Please take some 
time to fill out the survey so that we know how to improve and in the future and i hope that the content we provided to you today was of use to you all thank you very much for your attendance and we hope to see you again